Good morning. I wish that we had the luxury of not having to make any decisions when life is pretty complicated. But that's not always the case. And in fact, sometimes when life is complicated, we have to make more decisions than any other time in our life. And on top of that, those decisions that we're making in complicated times carry more weight and are more important than decisions we're making when life isn't complicated. So we sure need help knowing how to make good decisions. And one of the things we began a little over a month ago was a series of messages in regards to how to make good decisions during these complicated days. And the way I've approached it is to give us a series of questions that we put into our toolbox and we pull those questions out and we filter our decisions through those questions and we let those questions help us. I recognize that not all of you have been with us for all of those messages and so as I close up that series today, I wanna to begin with review and catch us up to speed on all of the ways that we can use questions to help us make good decisions. If you're taking notes today, I, I want you to find in your Bible Proverbs 11, 14. Proverbs 11 and verse 14. And then in your notes, let's go ahead and take our pen and write down the first tool. It's this question. Have I sought a multiplicity of godly counsel? H have I sought a multiplicity of godly counsel? Now, in Proverbs 11, verse 14, listen to what it says. Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. There's a key word there. It's the word fall. When I think of fall, I think of um, falling flat on my face suddenly. It wasn't something I expected. I, I, I trip and I fall. But the word fall that is used here is the idea of a slow disintegration. It, it's a slow departing from the path. In other words, where no counsel is, the people slowly fall away. But he says it's in the multitude of counselors that there is safety. That There is a safety that pulls us back to the place that we're supposed to be. Now, when I originally taught this question, I, I failed to say something that's really, really important. Just having the presence of counsel in our life doesn't guarantee safety. It's our adherence to that counsel that guarantees the safety. You and I may be sitting under the preaching of God's Word, we're in the Word of God, we are asking people for input, but just because we have exposure to counsel doesn't guarantee the safety. Now, when we taught this question, I emphasized three things. There's three ways this counsel shows up in our life. When you and I have put a multiplicity of counsel in our life, we are exposing ourselves to the consistent presence of preaching in our life. We're putting ourselves underneath the preaching of God's Word. And it's God's Word in those preaching scenarios that gives us counsel. Now, I'm thankful for the internet. I'm thankful for YouTube that enables us to have preaching that is available to all of us, sometimes from our watch, our tablet, our laptop, even our televisions. But there is a difference between a preacher of the Word who I do not know and a pastor that I do know who preaches the Word to me. Recently, I had a, um, an appointment with telemedicine. I, I had a physician's assistant that dealt with me on uh, regards to a health issue. And we were on the screen looking at each other, but I had never met her prior to that time. She had never met me. And she had a file in front of her, and she was looking through it, and she was attempting to help me. But it was very, very different than my times of interaction with my doctor that I know. The doctor that I know, he greets me as, oh, the kidney stone pastor. He knows me, and I know him. And what he does as he's helping me with present needs, he helps me with a context and knowledge of previous things that have happened in my health. And when you and I submit ourselves to the pastoral preaching of God's Word in our life, there's a great value and advantage.
But it's not just a continual exposure to the preaching of God's Word. There needs to be a continual practice of being in the Word of God personally. Every single one of us needs to be in a regular practice of opening the Bible and studying it for ourselves. Recently, I heard it said this way, when we're on social media or when we're watching the news, we're seeing how people are living. But when you open your Bible, you are seeing how people should live. And there's a great value in these days of turning off the social media, turning off the news. We don't need to know anymore how people are living. What we need to know is what the Bible says about how I should live. Now, in addition to the exposure to the preaching of God's Word, the continual practice of being in God's Word, you and I also need the consistent interaction with godly people who are living out the Word of God. You and I need people around us that we're interacting with who are living out this Word. What that does for us is it helps us put into practice what we're reading. As you and I see what God is asking of us, and then you see it in the lives of people around you, we see practical ways to put it into practice. In addition to that, what we also are encouraged with is the motivation that it can be done. They're living it out, they're living it out, and so can I. You and I need to surround ourselves with a multiplicity of godly counsel. And so I would ask you, as you're making decisions these days, ask yourself, have I maximized and used a multiplicity of godly counsel? That leads us now to our second tool. The second tool is this. Do I believe that God was good in my past, is still good, and will be good in my future? Why is that important? You see, if you and I fail to believe that God is good, both in what has happened in my past, what has happened currently in my life, and whether I believe that He will be good in the future, impacts the decisions we make. The person who has failed to believe that God is good is going to primarily be making decisions that are reactive. They are simply running from uncomfortable situations and they're looking for comfort. It's never good to make decisions that are solely reactive. There ought to be a proactive decision making in which we know where we are going. We're not just running from things. I really appreciate the life of Joseph. Chapter 50 and verse 20 he says, But as for you, ye thought evil against me. He looks at his brothers who had thrown him into a pit, sold him into slavery, and he says, I grant you, your motive was evil in what you did to me in the past. But listen to what he says. But God meant it unto good. He's crediting in the past that God was good, even in the midst of the wicked motivations of his brothers. But he goes on to say, to bring to pass as it is this day, that's the present, to save much people alive. The reason I love this verse is because that goodness of God that Joseph believed enabled him to be resilient. It enabled him to live optimally in suboptimal times. He believed that God was good in the past, God was good in the present, and God was going to be good in the future as he saves many people. That is the character of our God. And I pray and and really urge you to be making decisions today in light of God's goodness. Not reacting against things and running for comfort, but settled in the goodness of God. That leads us to our third tool. Our third tool is this, in the absence of knowing what is definitively right or wrong, what is spiritually best? Now, sometimes you and I are are going to, to have lots of data in front of us and lots of scripture in front of us, and we're still going to struggle to know what is right and what is wrong. That's not because the Bible is silent. In fact, the Bible speaks very loudly and completely about the things that we need to know in regards to what is right and wrong. The problem is never with the Bible. The problem is often with our ability to comprehend the will of God. Our brains and our mind are sometimes too small to fit the will of God into. 
And so the struggle is ours, not the Bible's. But when we come to those times when it's just really difficult to know what's right and what's wrong, it is best for us to make the decision in regards to the question, what is spiritually best? Now, if you were to turn to Hebrews chapter 11, you would find a whole list of individuals who did by faith what is spiritually best, but it didn't always pay off financially. It didn't always pay off physically. At the end of that chapter, men and women are dying as they do by faith what is spiritually best. Let's make sure we remember that what is spiritually best may not be physically best for ourselves and for others. And what we do that is spiritually best may not be financially best. We do what is spiritually best. There's a little principle that has been helpful for me these days, and that is to think of God's blessing here in my hand. And think of it this way. God places His blessing on the decisions that are made in regards to what is spiritually best. I may not have a physical outcome I hope for or a financial outcome I would hope for, but when we make spiritually best decisions. God takes his blessing and he puts it on top of that. And that's what we hope for. That all leads us now to the fourth question that I want us to ask, and it'll be our final question in this simple series. Here is the fourth question. Are spiritual and eternal things most important to me? Again, you've got your pen and your paper. Let's write it down. Are spiritual and eternal things most important to me? Now with that, let's go to 2 Corinthians 4. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I want to highlight verses 16, 17, and 18. Okay? 2 Corinthians 4, 16, 17, and 18. Listen to what the Bible says. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, as you look at those three verses, I ask this question to begin with. What is the decision that is at stake? What is the critical decision that these verses are helping us deal with? And I think you find the answer at the very beginning of verse 16 when he says, For which cause we faint not. You see, there's a regular occurrence in our life in which we are tempted or presented with the decision, are we going to be discouraged? Are we going to be disappointed? Are we going to be downtrodden? Or, at the extreme, are we just going to quit? Are we going to quit serving God? Are we going to quit following God? Are we going to quit obeying God? And the text says, for which cause we faint not. In other words, what he's about to present to us are the reasons, the, the truths that we filter the decision whether or not we're going to be discouraged through, whether or not we're going to be despairing, whether or not we quit. And now that I know that critical question and that critical decision that he's dealing with, I now ask this question. Is the Apostle Paul, who penned these words, is he qualified to answer the question? And I think he is. Look at verse 8 in the same chapter. We are troubled, he says, on every side, yet we're not distressed. He's every corner I turn around, I bump into trouble, but I, I don't get discouraged. We are perplexed, he says, but not in despair. We have more questions than we have answers, but we're not giving up. He then says in verse 9, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. A friend of mine, uh, he's a pastor. He and his wife uh, love to scuba dive. And I recently heard him tell the story of a man in Australia near the Great Barrier Reef. He was spending some time scuba diving with another group of scuba divers. And when he surfaced to finish his scuba dive, 
he came to the top and realized that all the people he had been diving with and the boat had left. When he came up out of the water, nobody was there. If I had been in his situation, I would have panicked. Could you imagine what that's like? Listen to it again. Persecuted but not forsaken. Do you realize that when you and I emerge from persecution, we will never find ourselves all by ourselves. We are promised the presence and company of God in persecution. And so Paul says, persecuted but not forsaken, cast down but not destroyed. Look with me at chapter 6, verses 4 through 10. Again, we're just trying to build the case. Is the Apostle Paul qualified to talk about this? In 2 Corinthians 6, verse 4, he says, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God. Now, the very next phrase we underscore because it, it shows us why we would include this. He says this, as the ministers of God in much patience. He says, we're enduring, we're sticking at it, we're not quitting. He says, patiently enduring. Enduring what? Afflictions, in necessities, in distresses. Now verse 5, he says, in stripes and imprisonments and tumults and labors and watchings and fastings. As you go down just a little bit longer in verse 8, he says, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report. And so there were times when people were speaking ill of him and Yet he continues on with endurance. He continues on in verse 9, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich. So in poverty, in accusation, in physical maladies that brought him to a place of nearly dying, Paul says in all of these things, we practiced patience. We endured. And so is Paul qualified to help you and I with the decision about whether or not we're going to be discouraged, in despair, downtrodden, or just quitting? And I think the answer is, yes, he is. So what is his help for you and for me in regards to the decision, am I going to be discouraged? Am I going to quit? Go back with me to chapter 4. Look with me at verse 16. In verse 16 he says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Let's write a principle down. In verse 16 he says, We don't quit because what God is doing in us spiritually is more important than what is happening to us physically. In our lives, what God is doing on the inside is far more important than what is happening to us physically on the outside. He says here in verse 16, though our outward man perish. Though our outward man just kind of slowly disintegrates, it slowly falls apart. God says what's happening on the inside is more important. I have a problem with my heel that surfaces every now and then, and the answer for that pain in my heel is to wear a particular kind of sock. It's a hideous looking sock. I, I put it on my left foot and, I, and the sock goes all the way up, almost past my knee. And there is a long strap that hangs off of the toe that has Velcro on it. And what you do is you take that strap and you bring it up to the knee and you loop it through a hook and you strap it. And so it, it kind of makes my, my foot and my toes point upward and it helps heal that heel. Well, it's a hideous looking thing, and the other night I'm, I'm wearing it, and I'm laying there in bed, getting ready to go to sleep, and I've got a foot out the side of the bed with that hideous looking sock on it. And I look over to my side, and Beneth is over uh, taking some ibuprofen to take away some pain and enable her to sleep without pain that night. And we both started chuckling to ourselves, saying, boy, aren't we the picture? 
me with my sock and her with her ibuprofen. And we, we thought to ourselves, is this what we have to look forward to as we move on in life? And you're nodding your heads. Yeah, this is kind of what you have to look forward to. The, the body just kind of slowly falls apart. And we, we just keep doing things, either to medicate that body or to try to pull its pieces back together. But listen carefully. This verse is teaching that though the outward man is just slowly falling apart, the inside of us, the spiritual part of us, is being built. And it's God that is doing that work. And there are times in which He uses the physical to work and build the spiritual. And so we don't lose hope. We don't lose joy. We, we don't get discouraged. We don't throw in the towel. Because what God is doing in our lives spiritually is just far greater than what is happening physically to us. As you and I look at verse 17, he says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. In verse 17, we find this, We don't quit because our future is better than our present. Let me say it again. We don't quit because our future is better than our present. Notice what he says there in verse 17, For our light affliction. I have to smile and almost chuckle a little bit as I read that because I, I think back to those list of things that qualified Paul to talk about this and I, I say, boy, what he experienced, I don't know that I would call that light affliction. In fact, if that's light affliction, then what I'm facing in my life is extra, extra light affliction compared to what he did. But as you see that word light, he, he's not talking there about uh, something being easy or painless. What he's talking about is that in comparison to what is to come, the afflictions of this present life are trivial compared to what is to come. He goes on to say, is but for a moment. It, it, it's momentary. It, it's at its minimum only going to be in this lifetime. I really appreciate what the author and preacher John Piper says. He says, present afflictions will never have the last word in our life. As a Christian, you and I are guaranteed that the only affliction we will ever face will be in this lifetime. You and I will not die and go to heaven carrying affliction in our pockets and in our backpack. It's momentary. At its minimum, it's only in this lifetime. Randy Alcorn, he says it this way. He said, for the believer, death is not the end of our life. It is the beginning of the real life. You see, as Christians, we live here. We experience affliction. But when we die, it's at that point that we really begin to live the good life with God in heaven for all of eternity and without any affliction. I was trying to think about how to um, illustrate this and to help us in a way that perhaps we would remember it. I have been trying to finish a book that I started a number of months ago and I actually put the book down uh, a few weeks back because I, I read a chapter and it, it just wasn't a good chapter. There was conflict in it. It, it kind of left me um, a little confused. And it, I say it this way, the chapter just wasn't grabbing me. And so I picked it up here recently and I read the next chapter and it was really, really good. Um, it, it, it made sense, some pieces fell together for me, and the storyline was enjoyable again. And I was, on a, I was on a roll, so I read the next chapter. And again, it, it just left me a little confused. It was a complicated writing style. And now I'm here sitting going, am I going to finish this book? There's good chapters and bad chapters, and I, I know if I finish it, once I get to the end, it all comes together, but I'm having a struggle right now. I've thought often 
about that, and, and, I, and I put it into the context of these truths. And, and maybe it'll help you to think of it this way. As a believer, our life story will have some hard chapters. But our life story will always have a happy ending. Okay, let me say it again, maybe a little bit different. Our life story is going to have some hard chapters. 2020 is one of those hard chapters. 2021 may be another hard chapter in our life story. But as a believer, we are promised a happy ending. We are promised heaven. In our text in verse 14, notice what he says. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ that gives us the confidence of a happy ending. It's the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ that reminds us that any affliction we have will only be in the present. And eternity awaits us with God forever because of the resurrection. In church history, after the resurrection, the church moved their day of worship to the Lord's Day. To that first day of the week in which there was a purpose there to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps one of the great tragedies of the Christian church is that the Christian church has relegated celebration of the resurrection to one Sunday a year at Easter. It would serve us well to think of every single Sunday as a celebration of the resurrection. It, it's what puts emphasis on the way that we live every day that, hey, this life has some present affliction, but the future, because of the resurrection, is far greater than anything I'm facing here. And so we don't get discouraged. We, we don't live in despair. We don't quit because the future is far greater than the present. Uh, go again to verse 18. Notice what he says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. There in your notes, let's write this. We don't quit because the eternal is greater than the temporal. We don't quit because the eternal is greater than the temporal. Look at verse 18. He draws our attention to our eyes. He says, while we look not at the things which are seen. Okay, so we don't focus in on the things that the physical eye can see. He goes on to say, but at the things which are not seen. And at that moment, we realize he's no longer talking about the physical eye. He's talking about the eye of faith. It is seeing things that I cannot see with the physical eye. It's the difference between the temporal and the eternal. And here Paul is saying, the eternal is far greater than the temporal. And therefore, we don't quit. You and I put the eyes of faith on the things the physical eye cannot see. And we find joy, we find encouragement, and we keep at it. This week, I, I lost something very valuable, very important, and um, it, it, it caused me to panic. I came home and, and we turned the house upside down looking for it, looking in both cars. Um, I, I went through every pocket of my pants and coats and shirts in the closet. I could not find it. And so the next day, I, I'm attempting to deal with that and to work through that. And uh, Beneth is home praying that the Lord would show favor in this regard. And, and I'm praying that the Lord would intervene. And as I went to go deal with this thing, I was about 20 minutes into it, and I realized that God had used the misplacing of this thing, though it was valuable here on earth, he allowed me to misplace it, to present a gospel opportunity with a person that I had to deal with. I, I found myself about 20 minutes into this thing, just having to put my jaw back up into my face because my jaw kept dropping. 
I, I just could not believe the open door that God had presented through the loss of something tangibly that my I can see that here on earth is valuable. And since then, I have thought often this week, it's not beyond the Lord to, to actually let some physical, tangible things be destroyed, to be lost, to be done away with, for the sake of something eternal that will not fade away, the soul of a man. I found myself extremely burdened this last week for individuals who are, are facing the possibility of death. I found myself praying for some folks saying, Oh Lord, just keep them alive. They don't know you yet. And folks, one of the things that keeps us going is that we keep our eye on the thing that lasts forever. But if we don't, and we let our eyes focus in on what the physical eye can see, we're going to focus in, we're going to try to hang on to those things, we're going to try to make those things better. But the Bible says those things are just going to slowly be destroyed. And if our focus is on those things, it makes sense that we're going to be discouraged because we cannot keep those things from fading away. But if our focus is on that which doesn't fade away, we'll find ourselves encouraged. Those eternal things mean far more than the temporal. I was reading a book about evangelism recently, and the author said that uh, there is a pain line in our evangelism. And, and that pain line is that invisible line that we're all well aware of in that in our witnessing and talking to people about the Lord, if I cross that line, immediately the relationship's going to get complicated. It's going to get difficult, maybe even perhaps painful. And, and the author said, we're really good at living underneath that pain line, and we slowly talk about nebulous things in regards to the Lord. Uh, we, we will say to people, we are praying for them, but we safely reside underneath that pain line. He went on to say that, that real evangelism is going to push us past that pain line to do whatever is necessary to see a person's eternal soul rescued and brought into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. When you and I are looking at verse 18, it's a verse like this that pushes us past the pain line that says any temporal pain is worth it for the eternal value of a soul that can be gained. There's a whole lot of things in our world right now that have our attention. Government, elections, but those are temporal. Diseases, viruses, that's temporal. Even Christmas, and the celebrations and the festivities that we're working on, those are temporal. And yes, we may watch those things, we may consider them, we may pray about them, we may work towards some of those things, but at the end of the day, it cannot be the focus of our attention. Those are temporal. Our eyes need to be on the eternal. I hope today that you use these verses and you make the choice not to live discouraged. Don't be a person who's in despair or regularly disappointed. I hope you're also not at a place where you're like, that's it, I quit, I'm throwing in the towel. These verses teach us plenty of reasons why we don't grow weary and quit. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this passage of Scripture. I thank you for its truth. And I pray that each one who is listening would find great encouragement and stay encouraged and stay in the will of God serving you because these things are true. In your precious name, amen.